Hi, uh, my name is Steve Greystock. I'm a senior programmer at the Toronto International Film Festival, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this digital Q&A for Learn to Swim. Uh, with us, we have two of the stars of the film, Emma Ferrara and Thomas Anthony Olajide, and the director and co-writer, Tyrone Tommy. So please welcome them digitally, however that's done. Uh, <laughs> so congrats on the film, guys. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. To, really powerful, beautiful piece. Uh, um, uh, you know, we were uh, immediately taken with it. Uh, uh, so I guess we'll just jump right in. Um, if you could tell us, uh, Tarn, if you could tell us a bit about how the um, uh, the story developed. Uh, I, 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 this, there was a kind of draft version, uh, a short film made a, a few years ago, although it was more of a sketch, I think you said, for the characters. Uh, was it always sort of set in the jazz milieu? How did it develop uh, uh, as you were working on the script? Yeah, no, I mean, first of all, thanks for, for having us at the festival. Um, excited to play here again. But uh, the the film, uh, it was written back in 2017. My Me and my co-writer, uh, Marty Van Dyke, um, were at the CFC at the time, the Canadian Film Center. And we wanted to explore the idea of someone going through pain, going through grief after a loss. Um, and, and we always knew that we wanted it to live in that sort of performance jazz world. Um, and I think that first short, that sketch was, uh, I'm glad you called it like a sketch because I feel like the, the feature film and the short film are so different from each other, like polar opposites of each other, but there are like little remnants of, of the short that are in the feature, but it was always sort of in that world. I think Desi started off as a trumpeteer um, it was just such a somber instrument, but then working with, with Thomas and finding out that he had like some saxophone abilities, um, we sort of pivoted when we went to the feature and, and switched the instrument. But um, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it just it sort of just naturally progressed from there. I don't think, I think what we felt when the short was done was that we hadn't quite, um, we hadn't quite captured the feeling that we wanted to get out of the short. We hadn't really, we, we hadn't explored that feeling the way that we wanted to. And we felt that going into a feature that the opportunity would be to do that. For sure. I mean, it is, it's quite different. I mean, uh, there is the, there are those elements like the, uh, you know, the, uh, well, there's, uh, Desi still, he's, he's sort of cleaning brass and things like that. And then the, the, the memory stuff sort of, and the, and the, uh, possibly overly friendly next door neighbor, uh, kind of, uh, but the man, you know, I mean, uh, uh, some of the components are still there. Certainly the memory sort of intruding and, and sort of, you know, throwing, uh, which is, I think one of the great aspects of the script in the film. Uh, do you, uh, I mean, it's a very, the, the way the feature developed, it's a, it's, a quite a complicated narrative structure. It's, uh, can you talk about um, how that developed? You know, yeah. the back and forth and the, the memories intruding and... Yeah, I think when when we first when we first made the, the, the feature, it was really just spending a lot of time with Desi in his own space, in his own head. And I think that like over the course of like a 10 minute short, then that's fine, but I feel like over the course of 90 minutes after a while ago, like, like, what is this guy's deal? Like, who is this person he's mourning? And um, we came to the conclusion that we need to meet Selma, um, his partner, in order to understand where his grief or his pain came from. But that required us to go back in time, essentially, and meet Selma. And so that sort of is what opened up that sort of gate of, okay, now we're going between two different time periods. And then it was just about finding a way to create those transitions in a way that was like seamless. Cause the movie still is at the end of the day from Desi's perspective, it is still Desi's narrative and his projection of, of, of memories and his projection of things that are happening. So it was about finding a way to also take that time period and seamlessly transition it into what we were experiencing in the present. Mm -hmm. I love the, the, the way it's edited too. And so it's like, it's quite, uh, elegant, but also like, I mean, that there's those scenes where he, you know, leaves the, that there's that scene where he leaves the, uh, the bar after mm -hmm. Selma's gone out to have a smoke and the, the bartender tells her, well, she's not, tells him she's not coming back. Uh, and then he opens the door and it's a completely different, like headspace. And, you know, it's, it's, you jump back to the present. I mean, it, 
all those cuts are really beautifully done. Uh, did you guys ever get uh, you. Thomas and, and Emma when you were doing it? Did you ever get like, oh, where am I now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But the the movie in and of itself was a kind of was jazz in a lot of ways. It was a lot of improvisation on showing up and seeing what was a, what was possible for us on the day. So that kind of became the the tradition, at least for me, uh, to show up and kind of go, where are we now? What are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also in watching it too, I, I really love the fact that like, you know, inside of grief, the timelines, like the timelines don't make sense, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about those memories that you have. So the way that it plays and the way that we did it, it was, it was just a really interesting kind of um, way, to, way to look back and look at it. Um, and I think it, it's like quite visceral in that you you really feel the grief through the through the the, the kind of way in which it's told. So yeah. Well, it, I mean, it really it really captures that uh, that structure really captures how overpowering it can be, and it just sort of yeah. you know it leaps up on you. Uh, um, do you, uh, I I wanted to ask a bit about the um, I understand all the much or most of the music in the film was was composed or created for the for the movie uh um you know it's a all mostly original music do you want to talk a bit about how, how that developed yeah the um all the all, all the music that's performed in the mu in the movie is original music so anytime like people like the stuff in the latin club that they're listening to or you know el raton that's on the record like that's you know those are classics but um Anytime anyone's performing, that's original music. And um, like I, we knew from the beginning that we needed to, to have the music beforehand so that for our performers and for everyone, that they could get it into their bones so you could kind of like hear what this band, who these people were before we actually started playing them out. So we, um, we worked with a bunch of uh, local musicians. We worked with um, Chester Hansen and Leland Witte. They're a band called Bad Bad, um, Not Good. We worked with Maggie Lima and like, Tiba Simone and these other artists. And um, it, it was, it, you know, they weren't always together in the same space, but, you know, we worked individually in different parts. But, um, you know, it was like having this sort of a consistent sound and sort of like taking these pieces and bringing them in and, you know, I think Chester and Leland wrote, you know, 15 songs and like, you know, the first song was supposed to be for the opening, but it ends up being what they use in the rehearsal. And it's just about finding like what mood and what place those those different pieces fit. And um, it, it was great. It was great seeing all the performers, you know, with Thomas learning saxophone, um, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> learning all the parts and everything with Emma coming and singing, you know, Emma's singing live in the movie, um, which is, which is incredible. Um, and also wrote the lyrics to that opening song. Um, yeah. So like, you know, Emma technically is one of our musicians that <laughs> hey. original music. So it, it, was, it was in the, doing it beforehand was definitely challenging because you have no idea how it's going to cut into what it is that you're doing and how you're gonna mold it. But you sort of have to, you know, along with like the transitions you spoke about, you just have to make these decisions really early on and then just like, cross your fingers and be like, I hope I get it right. I hope I <laughs> hope this works. Mm -hmm. I, I have to ask like, Thomas, is it, which is tougher? I've tried trumpet and saxophone and I have to say trumpet's harder. I would say so too. I mean, I, I've never even tried, I, I tried trumpet for five seconds and realized <laughs> that it was an absolute impossible. We did the trumpet actually in the short version, short film version of this. And um, we we obviously dubbed it, but the sounds that I created with the trumpet on, on the day were it was pretty unfathomably bad. Yeah, so I, I'll stick to saxophone any day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a. I think there's a. When I was trying to learn trumpet, there was a. There was somebody said, well, you know, they were talking about the various differences in the. Uh, uh, what somebody said, well, you. Most people when they play sax, it doesn't look like their head's going to explode. Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. don't get any sound out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, it's true. Uh, uh, but anyway, the uh, I did want to, I, I love the fact that it was such a great, like, sort of fusion of different styles, too. I think it really captures yeah. the contemporary jazz scene, which, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's sort of, 
you know, some hard bop and some cool jazz and, uh, but also like, uh, Latinx styles and, uh, um, you know, elements of hip hop and stuff like that. Was that, um, mm -hmm. were you always sort of looking to, uh, I mean, it, it is very accurate uh, of the contemporary scene. Yeah, I wanted it to sound, I wanted it to sound like what jazz sounds like now. I didn't want to like create sort of a, a th there's nothing wrong with doing that, but I didn't want to like create like a throwback sort of movie or like an ode to some other time period. I wanted it to feel very present. I wanted it to be something that you can hear now if you're walking down college, if you're walking down Queen, this is the music that you're hearing coming from a bar. This is the music that people are experiencing at this current moment. Yeah. Um, uh, how did the, uh, well, Thomas, you were involved with, with the short, but, uh, uh, and you know, of the same character, uh, but how did you, uh, how did the casting develop? Uh, uh, did you, do you, did, was the did you have actors in mind when you wrote it? Obviously, Thomas. But uh, um, how did that? How did and how did you guys? Uh, uh, if you want to talk about uh, getting on board uh, with the film, too, maybe Tyrone started and like talk a bit about the casting. Uh, about the casting, the yeah. I mean, I mean, from from the get go, it was always going to be Thomas. <laughs> I don't think we ever turned back. Um, you know, me, me and Thomas worked on Mariner together back in 2016. And, and you know, we just had such a great relationship and such a, a great amount of trust. And and I, I, re I really believe that, you know, that Thomas could capture this. He just has this ability with his face and with his body just to like, just to like live and breathe in, inside these characters sometimes. And um, I just enjoy working with him. And so it, it, it didn't, it didn't occur to me that there was like someone else to, to sort of play the role of Fezzi. Um, with Emma, you know, she auditioned for us and um, she, during her audition, she sang uh, uh, Chevelle Vargas's Paloma Negra, which was in the play, in our like Learn to Swim playlist since like the jump, since the very beginning. So it almost felt very serendipitous. Um, during <laughs> the and then um, when she came in the room, it was just like, Okay, like there's some. It was it's that cliche moment of like, oh yeah, there's some. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Did, did you? Did how did how did you guys prepare? Well, Thomas, you you already Emma. Do you want to talk a bit? Well, how yeah. did you how did you choose that song? I, I, um, <laughs> that song is like a real deep cut for me it, it, on the breakdown. It was like sing a Spanish song and it's one of my favorite songs. And also prior to this project, I didn't, I didn't really sing, um, at least not professionally, <laughs> um, for any reason. So it was one of the songs that I like could sing and I loved and evoked a lot of emotion. And then when I, um, got the script for my callback. I like, I remember I was at work and I just saw that Paloma Negro was like a song that Selma sang and I like almost fell over. I was like, what? It's just such a, a random song to pull. So yeah, it did feel very serendipitous, but um, it, yeah. And then coming in and meeting with Tyrone and, and um, meeting Thomas and it just flowed quite instantly, um, which was a very cool thing to experience. Uh, and then it was really, really interesting because I felt like, like as Tyrone was talking about coming from the short, going into the feature and kind of figuring out that we need to uh, discover who Selma is. And so I, it felt like um, a really interesting way to be kind of involved in creation of a character um, and um, uh, bringing out like who she is in terms of like, like we were talking about with the, the kind of old school Latinx, um, uh, ranchera, bolero style of music and infusing that with like this contemporary uh, jazz musician that she is um, was a really, really cool thing to do. And um, yeah, and then, you know, working with Thomas is, I mean, just a dream. So it, it was a, it was a, a very um, great time. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, I, I love the fact that it's the, um, much of how the relationship develops is sort of, it's, is communicated through it comes through them talking about music. Uh, you know, the whole, when, when you're, um, uh, when Desi's coaching uh, uh, Selma and, you know, there's the whole discussion about the mice and stuff. Uh, but, it, but it, you know, it's really about drawing people out and sort of, you know, establishing boundaries and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I it, it's just a really, 
smart way to do it. And I think it really, I, I don't know, it's just really quite struck, struck by that. Yeah, I think too, if I can add, like, the, one of the things that I, I find really, really interesting about their relationship is the push and pull of it and the kind of power dynamic that they are constantly, constantly playing with. Mm -hmm. um, and that really drew me to the character because it, it, it even though like, her story is and her the memory of her is told through desi there's still that that power dynamic and and that struggle of of their kind of pride and their egos and getting over themselves and kind of falling into whatever um their feelings are drawing them towards is still very present in his memory so like her strength and like her um her almost like her independence in the music and in that relationship is still very prevalent in his memory, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, you know, you guys have great chemistry together too, I think. And mm -hmm. I, I look at a lot of that because of that kind of, cause you can, cause it's in the script and you guys create that kind of push and pull thing. And I think it's often when people talk about chemistry, it's really about the rhythms that are created between the performers. Uh, you know, it's like the, and a lot of that's the push and pull thing. Uh, which I found like, you know, um, you know, when she leaves, uh, when, when Selma leaves to go smoke and the bartender says she's not coming back. And, you know, when, when, uh, Desi drops off, Des drops off the, the, the clutch and she, and Selma's like, you know, well, you could have left it downstairs <laughs> and, uh, and then it's like, but I'm making food and, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. you know, when they, the first time they try to go, you know, they suggest going, someone suggests going out, Des is like, oh, I'm, I'm, I've got something to do. And, you know, it's like, it's two in the morning, right? <laughs> or, you know, you know, really great back and forth. So, yeah. Um, is that, do you, do you, did it all come, you know, how do you guys, how, how does that develop? How do you work on that? Uh, is that, is it rehearsal? Is it all in the script? Is it like, you know, I mean, I know it's a bit ephemeral, I suppose, but. Yeah. Go I ahead, think. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. I mean, ahead. it was it was interesting because I remember, um, like, straight from the callback, like Thomas is uh, a force, and um, and I kind of recognized that right away. And <laughs> it's very fun to do the push and pull with him because there's so there's just so much to mine, and like he like. Uh, is so, a person that's so grounded that I'm constantly just trying to like, you know, push it a little. So that just kind of developed like really, really naturally. Um, and I think we ha both just had a really good understanding of like who these characters were and what they wanted and or what they, you know, thought they wanted. <laughs> um, so it was, yeah, I don't know, Thomas, if you wanna. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I feel like it has a lot to, it has a lot to do with the scenario and try and and you know when when the actors involved open themselves up to the realities of the scenario then mm -hmm. then uh chemistry happens a, a kind of chemical reaction happens and for an audience they might deem that chemistry especially between two characters that have a, have a romantic relationship but for me practically speaking it, that's that's all it it really is is just aligning oneself with the realities of the scenario and so for me, practically speaking, I, I don't necessarily engage any differently in the scenario between Desi and Salma than I would between any other scene in the film. It's just, is is are the realities of the scenario being given space to breathe or not? Um, so that's what and it kind of comes down to for me. Yeah. I think also that's a credit to Tyrone and, and the Absolutely. way he let us work. Um, Absolutely. And I, right. I mean, the the latin bar scene like in watching that i was just like <laughs> thinking about that day and a lot of yeah. like we we spent you know a bit of time just kind of really talking about the circumstances but then also just like being in that world and improving and like letting it flow yeah. um and and figuring out like you know again like that kind of oscillating power dynamic that they have and and really playing inside of that before even getting to like the meat of what we were saying and i think you know that that really um, informed the chemistry that that's there. So, cool. I we get I can do one more question. I wanted to ask about the uh, uh, look of the the film. I mean, it's it looks amazing, uh, uh, and it has a really um, distinct look. Uh, Tara, when we were talking before, you said you, you 
to some points you sort of wanted to evoke some uh, like Blue Note classic jazz album covers, or uh, but there's also a great. I mean, there's uh, it's a very there's a lot of stuff about um, there's a lot of elements where the, uh, characters are sort of framed twice, like there's a door frame that encloses them, particularly with the Desi's character. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about the visual strategy of the film? Yeah, um, you know, with this with this project, yeah, the Blue Note record covers were definitely the inspiration. Where we kind of, you know, most of the films I shot were in scope before, and this one is in in this one three seven format. And um, you know, and me and Nick Haight, who's a cinematographer, you know, we've worked together on Mary Mary and a bunch of other films. And you know, as we were like going through our references, I think if people looked at our references, they think we we're crazy. It was like Blue Note record covers, belly high music videos it was just like a weird mm -hmm. mixture of different <laughs> different things but um one of the things that we really wanted to do was we wanted every frame in the movie to feel like a photograph and we wanted all the actions and the things that the characters are experiencing to live within these photographs um and so you know a lot of the times it was you know with me and nick it was we had a shot list we had a plan but it was just walking into a space and you know we let you know, a lot of the times Thomas and Emma block it out and we go, well, well where, where do we want to be? Where do we want to see what they're, what they're doing? Um, and then that's, that's how we would find our frame. And, you know, you, you do the, the traditional sort of find the frame and you go in and get little bits of coverage, but it was really about just being very deliberate and very specific and how we were photographing and capturing their performance and, and things. And, um, I felt, I felt really strong about it. We started, you know, I think the first few days you're sort of like, how are we doing this? You're trying to find it. And then eventually we just found the rhythm and it just became, there's times when it just became obvious. You would see what they were doing. You're like, this is exactly where we need to be. Cool. Uh, it's an awesome film where, uh, uh, thanks, thanks for, thanks for bringing it to us. And, uh, um, uh, well, uh, look forward to doing it in public too. So, uh, in person. So, uh, um, congrats guys. Thanks for doing Thank this. You. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.